Okay, following the interview with uh, Republican Senate Leader Mitch McConnell, let's uh, chew on this for a moment. Joining us now, University of Maryland economist Peter Morisi and the Bonson Group managing partner David Bonson. Uh, hi, fellas. Did you hear? I, David Bonson, I want to ask you, did you hear the McConnell interview? Did you hear what the Senate Republican leader said? And if you did, what did you think about it? I sure did, Larry, and I liked what I heard. I liked the idea of red line under the the tax cuts, and I certainly liked hearing some defensive Israel. I don't know what I'm hearing these days from the left about our, our uh, friends in Israel. But ultimately, the issue that he reinforced is uh, the fact that we got economic growth out of the tax cuts of 2017 going into 18. We got non residential fixed investment for the first time since the financial crisis because of business optimism. I just can't believe we're considering undoing that coming out of this pandemic. I liked what I heard from the senator. And um, Peter Marisi, get your take also because um, Senator McConnell seemed to suggest, I mean, and as he acknowledged, you, you, you don't know until you know, but he doesn't think uh, all the taxes and the whole package can get through. He doesn't think all 50 Democrats will line up for it. Well, I agree. Uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for a Democrat with a lot of farmers in their state to vote for this or a lot of small businesses. Also, I had uh, breakfast just the other day, this week, with a prominent small businesswoman here in Washington. She founded her own management consulting firm. And these death taxes and income taxes are very tough. She's not an enormously wealthy woman. This is the sort of person that, you know, maybe has 25 employees and whatnot. There are a lot of black enterprises that are going to really be terribly harmed, a lot of minority businesses, and they won't be able to pass their estates along very effectively. Uh, you know, this isn't the kind of de Democrats they thought they were voting for. They'd like a Lyndon Johnson Democrat. Lyndon Johnson was proud of cutting taxes while he pursued civil liberties, uh, civil rights. This guy is just off the reservation. You know, I'm starting to think the gang in the White House, you can't criticize them because you were there in the last round, but I'm starting to think they were all asleep in class when we studied macroeconomics. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, JFK was even better than LBJ on taxes. Even better. I, I wrote a book on the subject, but let's not go there. Um, I want to go back to the perennial discussion about inflation. By the way, just as an aside, stock markets, I would say, Dave Bonds, I'd say to both of you gentlemen, stock markets by and large agree with Mitch McConnell that all this tax mania from uh, the Biden crowd is not going to happen. I mean, I think at this point, that's one of the implied messages in the stock market, Dave Bonson. Yes, and I think I've been saying that for some time now. Yeah. And so I get so many things wrong that when I get something right, I, I guess I want to bring it up. But the fact of the matter is, I just have never understood where he was going to get the votes, not just in the 50-50 Senate, not just with people like Cinema and Joe Manchin there, but even in the House. They only have five votes. Nobody talks enough about how the Republicans gained so many seats in the House that it took away margin for error in the Democratic House as well. Yeah, and you're right. And I can think of some honest to goodness, moderate Democrats in the Northeast, for example. They're not going to get their salt deduction back. And other than that, they don't like higher taxes. And I think that's very important. Peter Marisi, um, I'll read this uh, from the Fed minutes yesterday that shook everybody up. A number of participants suggested that if the economy continued to make rapid progress towards the committee's goals, it might be appropriate at some point in upcoming meetings to begin discussing a plan for adjusting the pace of asset purchases. And as you both know, Larry Summers has become even more critical of the uh, uh, potential threat of inflation. Now he's moved his attack from the administration to the Fed. So, Peter, how do you read that? Is the Fed going to change, not their policy so much, Peter, but is the Fed going to change its message sooner than people think? Well, I think they're going to try to avoid that, but they're going to be compelled by inflation. This is not a temporary spike in my judgment. Also, they really have changed policy already. Last year, they printed and enough money to buy over $3 trillion worth of bonds. This year, they're shooting at about $1.5 trillion. This demonstrates that they can taper and stop the floodgates and still have a strong stock market. We're going to get very, very strong corporate profits reports this July. 
that will put a lot of feet under the market. It'll lower the price earnings ratio substantially. That really offers the Fed at Jackson Hole an opportunity to start talking about phasing into a more normal monetary policy stance. And I think they would do well to grab that. David Bonson, you heard Mr. Morisi, having known Peter all these years, I have never, ever heard him so completely optimistic and bullish. I mean, it's really quite something. It puts Alan Greenspan's irrational exuberance to shame. Peter Morisi, bullish. Now, Leon Cooperman the other night told me that um, he's a fully invested bear, which is kind of the same thing. But anyway, do you agree with Mr. Morisi? Do you agree with uh, Leon, uh, Leon Cooperman? Well, there's oh, you know, think- different reasons that people could... I'm sorry, Peter. What I think is that what Lee was getting at is that there's so many reasons to be concerned. There's so many headwinds. And yet the best thing to do is still stay fully invested at this time. But what we're talking about with the Fed is so different when you talk about the language they may use versus the actions they may take. I watched this for years after the financial crisis of people sweating and crying and wondering what they're going to do because the Fed would change some language and then they didn't do it. They didn't raise rates. They didn't start tightening. I think the Fed has to get to a point where they start pretending. Read that sentence. Nine different qualifiers sort of pausing and hemming and hawing as opposed to just saying, hey, we're eventually going to quantitatively tighten. They're not ready to do it yet because they need to coddle financial markets. (laughs) That's the reality. Peter, you were going to say something. I'll I'll let you take us out. Well, I, I think it's important to recognize that a lot of the Fed policy is boosting housing prices to levels they're probably not comfortable with. You know, one of the things they can do is just start to pull back a bit on their purchases of mortgage-backed securities yeah. and keep supporting the yeah. Treasuries market. I think that, that, I think that the, the market would accept that and uh, that would be a prudent move. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, Larry Summers mentioned that. Nancy Tengler mentioned that on the show last night. Housing's in great shape. Why do they have to buy $40 billion of mortgage-backed securities mm-hmm. every month? That's a great point. All right, gentlemen, pretty good optimism on a Thursday evening. David Bonson, Peter Marisi, thank you very much.